Hello, this is Jack Probst. I'm a principal consultant with Pink Elephant. Today I'd like to talk to you a bit about some of the changes that are underway with respect to the ISO IEC 20,000 series and most specifically part one. Our agenda today will focus on first taking a look at the concept of standardization and providing you some background in terms of the organization that establishes ISO 20000 as a standard on a global basis and then we'll speak a bit about the evolution or life cycle of 20000 where did it come from um, and where are we today and then last but not least I'll give you a sense of the improvements that are being made to part one or what is normally the focus for certification activities so the standards development process all standards emanate from the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. ISO was formed on, in 1947, and it is intended to be the organization that promulgates the worldwide industrial and commercial standards, and in many cases these standards may become law. As the ISO organization was focusing on this evolution of information technology, it found that in many cases there was overlap with the work of another international standards body known as the International Electrotechnical Commission or the IEC. So a decision was made in 1987 to form a merger between ISO and IEC to address those issues that are associated with information technology. In order to do this the joint organization formed what is called a joint technical committee and in the, this case it was the first joint technical committee between these two bodies so it was referred to as JTC1. JTC1 in turn um, had in its auspices since technology is so pervasive it had the potential to address many uh, various areas that are relevant to information technology. So it, it, it formed various subcommittees and one subcommittee is subcommittee 7 which focuses on software and systems engineering and it is this area that has within it the uh, oversight of ISO 20000 or the service management uh, standards. In order for the standard process to function, there's a requirement that all of the various entities around the world or the national bodies that have an interest in standards and are members of the ISO organization, they must meet on a regular basis to make decisions. At the local level, these uh, decisions are being made by a group known as the Technical Advisory group or the TAG. In the case of US as an example, the TAG meets twice a year uh, with all of the various groups that have interest in the various standards and they take votes to establish the US position which is submitted on to the uh, organization that is accountable for the US position which is the American National Standards Institute or ANSI. Now the way in which the standards are organized is that under JTC1 and SC7 there are various working groups that focus on uh, a variety of interests such as testing or quality or what have you um, and as it would be within SC7 there's also the service management space each of these working groups has a number and for service management the working group number is 25 so there are meetings that are held um, within the TAG to focus on the various uh, elements of those efforts that are in front of the working groups and at the national level the, the subgroups are known as task groups or TGs. So we have meetings twice a year um, at the TAG level for the various task groups to evaluate and put, put forward the uh, American position. Uh, relative to standards. Those positions that are then taken forward to international meetings. There are two international meetings a year, one in the spring and one in the fall, and it's at these meetings that votes are taken 
relative to the various life cycle stages of, of uh, standard proposals um, or other types of reports, um, other actions that are relevant to the standard setting process. Now the standard setting process, there is a workflow for creation of standards. Uh, the workflow begins with a proposal stage or a new work item proposal and then working through various types of drafts, whether they're working drafts or committee drafts. Uh, these drafts are prepared by project teams. They're submitted to the various national bodies for opinion, uh, for comment, and for any suggested changes. Uh, ultimately resulting in a final up or down vote with respect to the overall draft itself which is called a final draft of international standard or a FITIS. If the FITIS is passed by the, uh, major by the national bodies then that FITIS is then resubmitted to ISO for publishing um, and uh, that usually takes uh, a few months to move from final vote to the actual publishing itself. So let's look at now at the elements that make up the ISO 20000 standard. Currently there are five parts that make up the standard. Part one, the heart and soul of the standard itself. This is the documentation that outlines the requirements for a 20000 certification um, and it's very specifically focused on the service management system. Part two, or the code of practice, is the guidance that an organization needs in terms of how to interpret the requirements of part one. Provides a bit more language and provides that assistance for an organization as they anticipate on how they're going to improve their overall management practices as well as their, the processes themselves. Part three is critical to an assessment in that it helps provide guidance for an organization to determine what will be the scope of the assessment or the definition of the scoping statement, which is what a certification auditor is going to focus on. Process Part four is the process reference model. The process reference model is a logical representation of the various processes that are called for in part one, provides some high level overviews of the process in terms of purpose and context and other references um, and integration points and so forth that are helpful to organizations they begin to think in terms of how will they design and implement processes per part one requirements. And then last but not least we have part five which is the exemplar implementation plan. Those organizations who would like to pursue implementation of the 20,000 as a standard of practice within the organization can turn to the implementation plan for guidance around that project. So where did 2000 come from? Well we could break 2000 down into three major phases. The first phase began as an effort of the British Standards Institute um, and a committee that was formed to begin to focus on service management. By 1995 the committee had developed a code of practice relative to service management and that code of practice was was published as a standard BS 15,000 and by 1998 at the end of phase one that code of practice had been updated. Beginning in 2000 or the second phase uh, the work of the group had uh, moved on to establish part one requirements uh, so beginning to nail down or to synthesize the work of the code of practice and in 2000 part two of the code of practice was republished. And then during this phase there was consultation that was sought from uh, industry such that the standards themselves could be updated. And then in 2003 ITSMF was asked to develop a certification scheme around BS 15,000 such that in February of 2004 three organizations were certified under BS 15,000. In October of 2004, uh, there was a submission made to ISO to fast track the acceptance of BS 15,000 as an international standard. So in uh, our last phase of the life cycle of 2000, 
We begin with the submission for fast track to ISO standardization, and then at the international meeting in May of 2005, the international community voted to accept the fast track submission such that by December of that year, ISO 20000, both parts one and part two, were published as the initial standards. And by 2006, the working group 25, which I had referenced before, was stood up and it began its work specifically on part three. Now, where are we today? Well, part three was published October of 2009. Part four was published in November of 2010. Part 5 was published in April of 2010. And just recently, in April 15th of 2011, Part 1, or the revision of the, the original submission of Part 1, was republished. Part 2 currently is, is under review and under revision. We are at the fittest stage, uh, or expect a fittest submission, uh, at an upcoming international meeting such that by the end of 2011 or early in 2012, we expect that Part 2 will be published as an international standard or the update to the original 2005 version. So let's take a look now at ISO 20000, specifically Part 1, and some of those changes. Let's start first with where the standard came from. So for those of you who are finished, familiar with 20,000, you'll recognize this graphic. You've seen this graphic before. It's detailed in both Parts 1 and Parts 2. But what's interesting about this graphic is that what it reflects are the 13 processes that are pertinent to 20,000, but what it's missing are the three management practices that are also critical to the overall assessment process. So for instance, it's missing planning and implementing the service management, it's missing planning and implementing new or changed services, and it's also missing the requirements for the management system. Those three elements need to be incorporated into the overall process and the process practices if one is to seek out the certification. So let's go from this graphic to where ISO 20000 has morphed or has transitioned for the 2011 version. So let's talk a little bit about the service management system, which is at the heart and soul of the ISO 20000 standard. Now, just for uh, purposes of sort of painting the broad picture in terms of what's changed um, from the 2005 version to the 2011, here's some sort of high-level things that have occurred first. Um, it's bigger. So there's 26 pages now compared to 16. Uh, it now is entitled the Service Management System Requirements, uh, which obviously places greater emphasis on this thing called a service management system. Um, and then last but not least, there's tighter linkage to uh, various other standards such as 9001, 27001, the Information Security Management Standard, and then IDLE version 3. Now, one of the things that really jumps out at you as you look at the standard is you turn to Section 3, which is Terms and Definitions, and you find that there's um, quite a bit of change in this uh, this space. So first of all, two definitions were very were deleted, which I find interesting. One was um, there's no change record definition, um, nor is there a service desk definition. Those are handled uh, within the body of the processes themselves. So in addition to those two deletions, there are 11 uh, definitions that have changed, and then and most of those are really wording changes more than anything else. But then there are 23 new definitions. 11 of those are tied to ISO 9000. Two of those are tied to the 27000 series of standards. And last but not least, there's one standard that's tied to 31000. All right, so let's talk in a little bit more detail, though, about this thing called a service management system. So first and foremost, for those of you who are familiar with um, the IDLE framework, you know that... Uh, it's all tied back to the customer. Everything starts with the customer, and that customer is going to have very specific service requirements. Those service requirements are exercised by the various processes that make up the service management system, such that services are then delivered directly to uh, the customer. At the heart and soul of the service management system um, are various management practices that are uh, key ingredients to making this thing work. So 
first and foremost is a section on management responsibility and there's been some expansion in terms of the uh, the various elements of management responsibility um, especially there's a, a section that outlines um, uh, the management representative and what the management re representative is expected to perform. Um, also there's now more detail with respect to governance of processes that are being operated by other parties. Um, there's the expectation that the service provider will provide uh, direction um, for any of those processes that are under the governance of someone else. And then documentation management, quite a bit of additional information, especially around the control of documents um, and the control of records. Resource management, uh, the, the key issue with resource management is uh, the human resources and it, it provides some combination of elements that were part of uh, competence awareness and training in the old uh, standard but uh, uh, a fair amount of information around resource management and then the need to establish the SMS which is tied back to the the dimming life cycle so plan do check act great detail with respect to expectations in terms of how um, the service management system itself should work, uh, working through the, the dimming cycle. Um, and moving from there, we then move into uh, a new section. Uh, this section is the design and transition of uh, existing services. This is the combination of section 3, or 4 and 5 of the original standards. So planning and implementing service management and planning and implementing newer chain services. This has all been combined into a brand new section one. So what we find um, in this section is uh, some additions such as how to design and develop a newer chain services, adding how do you transition those services um, and so forth. So there's, there's quite a bit more detail to provide guidance for service providers as they begin to think in terms of how they're going to manage the, the, the changing service portfolio. All right, so now let's go into a bit more detail with respect to changes to the processes themselves. So the first set of processes are the service delivery processes. And including the service delivery processes, we start off with the service level management. Um, not a lot new there except uh, a little more emphasis on the customer. Um, but also there's uh, mentioning of... Uh, the OLA uh, review or operating level agreement and the need for that. Um, service reporting is primarily um, could be characterized in terms of just ex expanded language um, in that section of the, um, uh, the standard. And then we move on to service continuity and availability management, a bit of, of rewording, uh, quite a bit of detail in terms of expectations around the service continuity plans and also a requirement for an availability plan. When we move on to budgeting and accounting, uh, not much has changed here. Um, it's pretty much the same language as you saw before. Um, they've added in uh, a requirement for capital and operating expenses, but uh, not much has, has moved in this regard. When we go to capacity management, um, we do find that there's a requirement for the, uh, the description or for a capacity plan and providing description for what that plan should be. And then finally, information security management, as I mentioned earlier, uh, much tighter emphasis with respect to ISO 27001, um, quite a bit of detail in information security controls, and a brand new section on information security changes and incidents and the requirements that are associated with managing uh, those incidents. In the relationship processes, we start off with business relationship management. Not much has changed in business relationship management. A bit of rewording um, and some integration with service level management. In supplier management, though, um, a fairly uh, significant addition is the requirement for uh, what are the expectations relative to a contract. So there's a number of items that uh, an organization or a service provider should be looking for as they think in terms of uh, contracts and, and contractual terms. Moving to the resolution processes, 
Um, incident and service request management. Notice that we've added re service request management. That wasn't there in the 2005 version. Um, new items in the um, uh, incident and service request management, a bit of rewording, uh, just calling out the various activities that are associated with uh, incident management. Um, and also there's uh, emphasis on how do you, would you manage um, a major incident, which is, is new to 2011. And then problem management, again, a bit of rewording around um, the activities, just calling them out in terms of bullets, um, new terms such as root causes, um, and how, how you would address those. And then last but not least, um, in the event that a root cause could not be uh, addressed, um, that there's a requirement for reducing or eliminating the impact of the problem. So that's, that's new to the 2011 version. And then we move on to the control processes. First of those um, is in configuration management. And we find in configuration management a significant amount of detail with respect to what you might expect to see in the definition of a configuration item or a CI. And then uh, also calling for a uh, defined interface uh, between configuration management and financial uh, asset management. In change management, which is probably the most significantly changed process in terms of descriptions in the 2011 version, uh, we find that the, there's the call for a change management policy, uh, also the requirement that if you're going to remove a service, that there needs to be analysis to assure and define and assess the major impact that might be um, occurring as a result of uh, removing that service. Um, and also there's some issues around scope and classification um, and basically just assessing overall uh, the effect of changes. Also a requirement that changes will be developed and tested and then that CMDB records should be updated as a result of the change effort itself. The other big change that comes as a result of the, the 2011 uh, series is that we've now added within the control processes release and deployment management. Um, and not a lot is has changed there. It's a bit of a, a broadening of the description in terms of acceptance uh, of, um, of the release. Uh, there's also inclusion of, and language around deployment and what's needed. And then uh, finally, there's uh, a bit more language around uh, integration um, uh, efforts that, that need to occur between uh, various processes and also to assure that there's integration between release and deployment management. And that's pretty much it for the service management system and all the processes. So at a very high level, those are the changes that have occurred um, between 2005 and 2011. All right, just a couple other uh, activities to wrap things up in this webinar. First is um, there's a new work item proposal for Part 10, which are terms and definitions. Um, and also there's some activity that we're expecting to see our te as technical reports to map ISO 20,000 to other standards such as uh, and other frameworks. Uh, so for instance, uh, mapping ISO 20,000 to uh, such frameworks as IDLE. Um, and also Working Group 25 is working with the I, uh, IT Governance Working Group or Working Group 40 around a process assessment model. We expect that there'll be a co-labeling of uh, the process assessment model as part eight of uh, the ISO 20000 series. And then last but not least, there's work with um, the standing committee uh, 27 uh, within and working group one within uh, standing committee uh, 27. Uh, and that is around uh, ISO 27013, which is a description of how does ISO 20000 and the 27000 series, how do they map together? All right, so let me wrap this up. Um, if you are interested in some sources for information, uh, here are some websites that you can turn to. Uh, obviously, the ISO site you can go to to not only uh, get great information about ISO and the ISO standards, but also 
uh, for you to purchase the standards as well as you can get them through uh, through ANSI. And then if you're interested um, in the certification, uh, the ISO 20000 certification site, uh, as well as the accreditation board uh, are great places to turn. So that's it. Here's my uh, uh, particulars. I want to thank you very much for your attention today. I hope that this has been useful for you. Um, follow me on Twitter, and if you have any questions, you can shoot them to me at j.probes at pinkelephant.com. Thank you very much, and we appreciate you working with Pink Elephant. Bye.